talking about bringing it around to the film, tell us a little bit about this film because, of course, our listeners are going to be able to watch this very, very soon. So give us the lowdown a little bit about this film. Yeah, yeah, sure. So it's called The Spy Who Never Dies. So, you know, it's, it's a, bit of a bit of a genre bend, an action action comedy with a, a bit of romance in there. It's about like a... It, it's a, a, a sort of a take on the James Bond, the spoof of the James Bond side of it. But I wanted to play a little bit more serious on it. So it's about this sort of world-class spy. He's the best. He seems to escape death or have a lot of near-death experiences, um, whether or not he's just super lucky or he just manages to... You know, his skill level's just high enough to get him out of trouble. But uh, like in some of the Bond movies, you know, he wants he wants out of the agency. He's like, I'm done. He meets a girl. And yeah, from there, he says to his, his boss, I'm out. Like, I, I don't want to be involved. And, and of course, as their best spy, they want him in, still in. So they do a deal. They say, just take some time off. Spend some time with your girl. And in the meantime, we've got uh, some Russians uh, that are stealing some hypersonic missiles. Uh, and so he, had, he quickly gets brought back into the fold. They're like, we really need you to help us solve this problem. And he, so he's, he's there trying to manage the relationship or with this girl, sort of lying to her about who he is and what he does. In the meantime, trying to take down these or foil the Russians' plot to, to, uh, to use these hypersonic missiles. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun, and, you know, I had a great time making it. It was a lot of fun on set, but, um, yeah, that's kind of the general vibe of it, yeah. Now, I guess casting would have been a big problem for you with this film. How do you go about finding a James Bond-esque character, but also how do you find an actress that can play a character that can stop a James Bond character from wanting to work? Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. Look, I mean, Paul O'Brien, who was the who I, I played, um, I cast as uh, as Brad in the film. I'd actually done a previous film with him. It was my first feature called Message Man, and uh, we shot that in Indonesia. And um, you know, I, I'd done another film in between. And I went, you know what? We had a good time. So I'm um, very much about having a good time on set. You know, I want to enjoy the process. It's 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 not easy making films. Uh, there's a lot of glamour side around it, but, but in reality, it's hard work, you know, and, um, and so, you know, I contacted Paul and said, hey, listen, I want to do this film, and, and Paul's uh, quite charismatic and quite funny, uh, as a general rule, and, um, and then, yeah, I sort of put the castings out, and, and uh, Georgia Walters was amongst them, Paul had already sort of done some acting classes with her, or where she had used him, and uh, sent it through, and same thing, she just had a great presence, and uh, straight away, thought you know what? I, re- I reckon she could easily do this role, and so from there it just expanded out. Um, we've got Cass McGraw on playing uh, Susan, which was fantastic. She was amazing to work with, a true professional. Teresa Liani, she was brilliant. Just didn't miss a beat playing uh, Trident, the main villain. Lo- lots of fun with both all of those guys. Um, so yeah, the casting process was was I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I think. You know, one of the things these days that becomes, part of, it's always been part of the discussion is who's in your film. And, you know, for me, I, I kind of embrace this idea of at the end of the day, we need to give emerging actors a vessel and a way to, you know, get get their profile up and raise it and prove that they can act. And that's one of the things that Arrhythmic Films that we're really focused on is giving that opportunity um, to those emerging actors, you know, we make sure that obviously they can they can cover the role, but attitude as well and and um, talent, yeah. Now you said about having fun on set, but one of the things that happened during this production was you had to film during a pandemic. Tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and how that changed things. Yeah, that was quite a shock to the system. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, like. I remember when it when it first kicked in. I I don't think any well when it first happened. I think we started shooting probably about two weeks before the like COVID even existed. And I remember when it first when it first came out. It's like and I, no one knew exactly what was happening. Is this serious? Like what's this really about? And then obviously as the restrictions started to roll in and the seriousness of it, it was like oh okay we've got a serious problem here. So for us. 
Yeah, I mean, there was two. There was two kind of options uh, that production productions were facing, uh, or options that they had. One was like you kind of shut your whole unit down, shut your production down, regroup. Um, and and the other way is like just thinking laterally. How do we continue on? How do we how do we reshape our work environment um, to to be able to manage the COVID from a safety perspective, but also you know, still not let the film um, the film quality uh, be affected by that as well. And so for us, we kind of reevaluated lots of things. Everything was put under the microscope: cameras, camera tech, tech audio, uh, crew requirements, um, how and uh, you know how we scheduled everything, uh, how we, uh, and, and then of course the other variable is we have no idea moving forward what is going to happen so this feeling of like uncertainty with every decision we've made so we had to consider that as well um so as a result what we ended up doing was breaking the whole shoot down into blocks that based on the COVID restrictions at any moment in time we knew we were adhering to the rules we we're doing what we needed to uh we wouldn't we wouldn't have to sacrifice for quality and we could get the job done with the crew numbers that we were able to get. And so it would, it would be anywhere from, I remember one, on one shoot block when it was at its worst, you know, we had people in the hallways and everything, all social distancing, and we could only have like three, four crew in the room at one time. Yep. Uh, so, you know, we had our sound guy doing the clapper, I was operating, focus pulling at the same time, and we had, <laughs> it was just, and, you know, we still had everybody there, but we just couldn't get everybody in the room, and that was, a, well, we need to reframe. We need to really evaluate a better option. And so, yeah, we we kind of just did these little micro shoots, you know, anywhere from three to four days. I think the biggest shoots uh, shoot block we did was, I think eight days, and we did 13 shoot blocks, different blocks of shooting throughout the co- the whole two years of COVID. Wow. Um, yeah, so it, it really, it was, a, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, I was, uh, you know, taking a positive from a negative, I'm really kind of glad we went through that experience because it forced us to evaluate, you know, processes and procedures that have been around for a very long time and, and also look at new technology, like what could we do with new technology to minimise our or streamline our workflow. Uh, and yeah, it was so, you know, glass half full. Uh, I think uh, we, we walked away uh, stronger, yeah. And I understand the black magic equipment made that side of things a little bit easier as well. Tell us a little bit about what black magic equipment you used and how did that make things easier during that COVID period? Yeah, so look, I, I actually hadn't had anything to do with Black Magics at the beginning of the film. We were actually shooting on Alexa large format cameras, and they're, they're big cameras. These weren't the mini Alexas. They were the, the full-blown Alexa. So it's a big unit, requires a lot of battery, um, a lot of equipment to, to move it, and the lenses we had, um, Prime, Ari Primes, or Signature Primes, so everything was big. And, and you know, it's great. I love playing with the big toys, but obviously with that comes, you know, we need two or three camera techs just for the one camera. And, you know, the first block of shooting, we're down on a wharf shooting, and it, and it, was, yeah, it was a lot of work. But um, when after COVID hit, we were like, okay, the first thing we need to do is, is look at solutions around this camera stuff. Because I do like to move pretty fast, you know. I mean, uh, I like to do a lot of handheld stuff, um, and I don't like – I like to be able to make choices on the fly pretty quickly. Um, and so we started the, the process of doing research about the cameras and, you know, I did all, oh man, the amount of hours I spent looking through and then I stumbled across a, um, a YouTube video that some guy has had put an Alexa LF up against a red 6k and a black magic 6k. And so they had the three cameras side by side. They had you know, everything, everything was shot the same, everything was set up, same lenses, all of that kind of thing. And then they put it out to test and got audiences' responses. And the black magic won from the audience feedback. Now, I'm not, you know, for me, I mean, yes, Alexas are incredible cameras. But when you look at the footprint 
the difference in the footprint and the requirements of moving the systems around, there was no question in our mind that we wanted to really explore black magic. Yep. And so so we so we did. We went right down that process and not only did we look at the cameras, we looked at the entire workflow. So, you know, whether it was moving from um, Final Cut to or, uh, or Premiere Pro to Black Magic, because at the time they had actually just released, uh, or it hadn't been out too long there, the editing by, uh, the editing um, module for their DaVinci Resolve. And so as an editor as well, you know, I jumped on there, did some test editing. I'm like, man, this is pretty good. This is really intuitive. It's fast. Uh, But then obviously the next part of that was looking at the data flow uh, because when you're shooting 6K RAW, it's a lot of data. Proxies, you start to get into the proxy world. And then when you've got a lot of visual effects, having to lift those. And then that's when we're like, oh, my God, we can bring in 6K RAW footage off, a, off these Blackmagic cameras directly into our drives and then start editing immediately and not have to worry about proxies and linking. And I was like, oh, my God, they've done it. Yay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, yes, someone's thinking really well. <laughs> so I was, I was really happy about that. You know? and, so, and, and that was why. It was, it was a combination of the quality of the camera, what they had done, what they had managed to build, they kind of, I don't know, they kind of, yeah, they'd given a lot of thought to what everyone needed as a cinema camera. You know, yeah. we, we didn't want manual focus. We, we never have that. We always have focus pullers. Um, so for, when you take it and go, we're, we're just looking for a camera with a great, a great sensor, a great look, great color science uh, that can catch what we need. And then, of course, the, the native ISO or the dual native ISO sensor in the Black Magic was, um, I think it's 250 or 400 and 1250. And yeah. when we would push that sensor to the 1250, it was incredible. Like its low light performance was fantastic. So from there, I kind of, once we shot a couple of days with it, I'm like, well, I'm not going to go backwards from this. This is fantastic. Uh, and and so yeah, I've really we've really embraced that entire workflow. Yeah. So will you keep using them now on your future projects as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, for for many many reasons. Um, first off, I really love that it's an Australian company. That's fantastic. Um, but also, you know, I think that I think that they're just what they're doing, what they what they the, the way that they're building this ecosystem and this pipeline where it's not just a camera. It's a camera that that integrates into this in- incredibly uh, powerful workflow, and then into color. Like to be able to sit, like it's it's interesting. I don't really call the edit suite an edit suite anymore. I call it the command center. Yeah, and, and that's literally because one person can sit now with DaVinci Resolve, with the data in you know in the system and. They can jump between the sound. They can jump to the color. You want to throw a quick little light on there, bang, 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 bang. Like, I mean, yeah, you can do that with the other software packages. But DaVinci is known for its color. Yep. And so, you know, you can very, very quickly uh, build a workflow. And, and also the file management systems within DaVinci too. I was really, really happy with that. It's very simple, very intuitive. Um, and, and then... You know, obviously, we were learning a lot about DaVinci, and what I, what I love about it is, you know, when you first start playing around with it, it's quite intuitive. But then you start to realize there is so many features inside of it when you're ready to get them and use them. Yeah. So there's all these layers, you know. So it's like when you're ready, just go deeper. Go that extra level, and, and yeah, you'll be able to sort of find it, yeah. Now, we've got a lot of young filmmakers that listen to this show, and they're probably thinking we're hearing so many people talk about Blackmagic cameras at the moment. Are they a camera that a young filmmaker can, first of all, afford, but also learn to use very, very quickly? Oh, uh, yeah. Look, out of... If, if you're a filmmaker that wants to literally, you're not, it's not about stills, you're not trying to find an all-in-one camera, because that's not what that camera is. So, you know, you read a lot of the people in their comments on, on the Black Magic's like, oh, it doesn't have autofocus. Like, it's not supposed to have autofocus. It's that it's a cinema camera. 
So, you know, you want your focus system because uh, a focus gives you creative control over the focus. Yep. You know, you want to focus, you want to rack focus to different objects. Uh, you know, you want on the left side. So instead of fighting the camera on this automatic focusing systems, you're creatively using that. So I would say to any filmmaker out there, this is personally my, from my perspective, it, you know, I, I look at what The Spy Who Never Dies, what we're able to achieve on, uh, with those cameras I mean, that's kind of testament to, like, you, you can get the look you need. It's not a question. So now if you go to even a 4K, like we shot the 6K cameras, even the 4K cameras, you can make that look as cinematic as any other camera. Yeah. Uh, what what the, the job of uh, all I'll say to young filmmakers, uh, emerging filmmakers, is once you've got that, then it becomes your understanding of what the lenses are doing lighting and composition uh you know those are the elements that you work with because it's literally like you can get that camera to do whatever you need it to do you know from a cinema perspective yeah definitely well Corey, thank you so much for giving us that insight into black magic and i guess to finish off where will people be able to see this film like where in australia can we expect to see it and when can we expect to see it so, well, so The Spy Who Never Dies is on stand at the moment. It's uh, Yeah, it's been running there for, for about a month or so now, a couple of months. So, yeah, jump on stand, check it out, enjoy it. You know, it was, uh, was intended to be – I mean, one of the things that I was really happy about was during COVID, we couldn't have been making a better film. <laughs> you know, like yeah. we were – there was a lot of laughing, a lot of carrying on on set, and we, I just hope that people just get a, a, a chuckle out of this film and enjoy the ride that it is. You know, it's uh, it was a lot of fun and, and um, it was a lot of fun making it and, and it's it's been fun watching it, yeah. Definitely. Well, mate, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. It's been an absolute honour yeah, no having worries. you on the show and we can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks so much, mate. You take care. Thanks, thanks for having me.